This is John from Global Traveler. Today we're talking travel with Ryan Crane, entrepreneur, traveler, author. How are you, sir? I am well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited to talk to you about it. You know, I, I was in the uh, uh, roaming through Amazon and I'm always looking for interesting travel books and I saw yours and it kind of jumped out at me. Um, it's it's uh, Gravel Roads, One Man's Quest Around the World to Heal and Live with No Regrets. Interesting title. Um, interesting cover, I should actually say too. So tell us a little bit what led to that book. I, I know there was um I know there was a poignant moment in your life. So tell us about that. So that's a really potent question. And um I'll try and be as succinct as possible, but there were two main events that led to some extended travel around the world that I took, which ultimately led to my book. And so the first was just a really crappy breakup. I just had, it was my first breakup with my first girlfriend. And I just wasn't expecting it. I was blindsided. And that was kind of a really defining moment for me to just pull out of this, this self self inflicted funk I was in for months and months on end. And then the second was a, the passing away of a dear friend at 33 years old, just unexpectedly wow. passed away. He was the same age as me. And so the, the grief from both the breakup and the friend passing away was just overwhelming. And I realized I just need to travel now before it's too late. You know, you, tomorrow isn't promised anyone. So I sold everything I owned um, a week or maybe two weeks after my friend passed away. I bought a one-way flight a week after that. I resigned from my job a week after that. And just the dominoes started falling. I landed in Lisbon in September 2018 with a one-way flight, and I just wanted to explore and see the world. So, gravel roads is a gravel is a play on words of grief and travel. So that's kind of where the title oh, comes cool. from, and it's about dealing with that and my travels around the world. So, so why travel? I mean, you had to have it in your mind for you to say, "Well, I just decided to travel." Like two weeks after all this stuff happened, was travel on your mind before that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So in the in the beginning, uh, after the bad breakup, it wasn't. It was just I never I had never left America. Um, I didn't really want to leave America. I just didn't have a desire. So travel was never really on my mind. It's just this thought. It, I thought it was something wealthy people did, privileged people did, and and there is privilege in travel, but. Um, it wasn't even on my mind. And then I, I took this random trip to Boston and I just caught this rant, fleeting smile on my face while I was going through the heavy emotions of the breakup. And I was like, you know what? If this is what it takes to get through this, this funk I'm in, I'm going to keep traveling. So I just kind of kept pushing past my comfort zone. Then I went to Cuba and then I went to Europe and then I went to... South America and then Asia. And I like went a little further every time. And I just eventually fell in love with it. I realized how similar people are all over the world. I realized how much I was learning about myself in the process and how important it was to explore other cultures and religions and nationalities. So it just was this, initially it was just this way to move through grief. And then eventually it just, I just fell in love with what I was learning about myself in the world. It was very unexpected. So why Lisbon? Why why Lisbon for your first trip? You know, to be honest with you, it was the cheapest flight okay. that I could fly into Europe. I had zero expectations for it. I had booked a few other trips to cities I was more interested in, like Madrid and Barcelona and Rome, you know, the more popular cities. Lisbon was just supposed to be the stopover city because it was the cheapest flight. I had no expectations for it. It is now my favorite city on the planet. Wow. I adore Lisbon. It is so special and so unique. And again, it just it's because I had no expectations for it. And wh why a one way? I mean, obviously, that you had uh, did you have plans to be away for a long time, or was it you just didn't know how long and you just wanted to play it by ear? Yeah, it was a little bit of both. So a little bit of both of that. So after my friend passed away at 33, I, I said, you know, what? I want to cut all strings to my previous life. I, I sold my car, I quit the job, I downsized my possessions to a couple of bags. I just had this itch to explore for as long as I could while I could. So it was a little bit of both. My, the goal in my head was one year. I don't know why that 
that came to fruition. One year just seemed like a nice round, even number. But I was also to, open to coming home earlier or later, just depending on budget, depending on how tired I was. But um, I just wanted to see as much as I could while I could. And the one-way flight was just kind of this commitment to myself of like, okay, I have no timeline. I have no deadline. Let's kind of just push the limits of my mind and my boundaries to see how long and how far I can go. Well, when you said you had a job and you said, you know, you took Lisbon because it was the cheapest flight. So I'll assume you weren't independently wealthy. Um, did you plan out like how how much money you could spend during a certain period of time? How did you figure out your monetary concerns? Yeah, that's a good question. So I was just I've always been hyper diligent with my expenses, and that was just something my father instilled in me from a young age: just save, save, save. And I woke up one day in my thirties, and I realized, well, I have a decent little amount saved, but what can I use it for? I I don't, I don't want a new car. I don't want to buy a house. And so when travel came onto the horizon and the idea of seeing the world for a year, I set aside a, a number in my head, like, okay, I can spend this amount of money before I need to come home or get work. And that was my goal. So I set aside. So I'll just tell you my budget. My budget was $30,000. That was the budget I set for myself. Just if I pass that, surpass that, I need to come home. Well, I traveled for one full year, 34 countries, six of the seven continents. I only spent $19,000. Wow. Well, there, well, there's a whole other discussion that we got we to talk to you about. You know? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but when, when you're when you're planning the trip, then did you have things planned out? Like, Because it seems to me like you kind of went on the fly a little bit. How did you find the best prices going that type of lateness? Um, yeah, really, really good question. I love this question. So I only booked my first week in Lisbon. I had nothing else planned after that. I did not know where I was going to go. I couldn't tell you week by week where I would end up. But I had a few uh, criteria that I was using to decide where I would go next. And so the first one was just reasonably priced transportation. So nothing outrageously priced. The second was to a city I really wanted to go to. So for example, if I really wanted to go to Budapest, I would put that on a higher priority list than let's say Dublin. You know, Dublin doesn't interest me that much. And then the third criteria was I wanted to keep moving east around the world. I didn't want to backtrack. So mm -hmm. reasonably priced transportation to a city I really wanted to go to and continuing to move around the world. That was kind of how I how I found where I was going next. And I just winged it. I just week by week would look up options and if i found something that met all three i just booked it and after you got back home where was home by the way at this time so home was oklahoma city oklahoma born and raised okay so go sooners so when you got back <laughs> to oklahoma how did it feel it, was there a sense of disappointment was there a sense of relief what, what were oh, your man. emotions coming back this is a whole another discussion as well. The, the re-entry back to America and back to home was overwhelmingly intense. Um, I refer to it as reverse culture shock. I was not expecting to feel the dichotomous emotions I was feeling. So I had these expectations in my head that friends and family would want to hear all of the powerful and special stories because I I had a lot to share and I was ready to share them. And I was ready to have some more polarizing and potent conversations, you know, conversations that a lot of people don't seek out. And I was ready to have those, but I get home and I realize most people just don't really care all that much. And they just wanted to know my favorite city. How was my vacation? Or sometimes I just got a welcome back to the real world. And that's all I got. And it took my mind a while to wrap my head around this like why aren't they more curious why aren't they questioning me more and eventually i realized they're just coming at me from their own understanding of the world you know they can't possibly have related to me and how it feels to travel for one full year and just like i couldn't relate to them and the life they were living so it was very hard along with i was just confronted with some heartbreaking gut-wrenching scenes 
abroad, India, especially really, really pierced my soul and really changed how I view the world. And just uh, some of the generational poverty that exists around the world is very real. And it's very, to me, was very life changing. So I was living in this weird world coming home, this reverse culture shock where I wasn't fitting in with friends and family. I, I was reconciling a lot of emotions and scenes I saw around the world and the privilege that I carry as a, a man from America. So it was hard, John. It was very hard. And it took me about a year to just accept wow. and embrace kind of these negative emotions and from what came from a really just powerful, epic human experience. So I, I want to get back to that in a second, but you mentioned, you know, how are you, you talked about how the kind of like negative uh, feedback or lack of feedback, maybe it's better. Then how did you decide to write a book? And did it come to your mind? Like <laughs> if my family and friends don't want to hear this, who's going to want to hear this? <laughs> so that's actually why I wrote the book because I just had so much more to say than people wanted to hear. And it was, for me, it was very cathartic. And so I actually just started writing for myself, I had no idea it would actually turn into a book. I just needed to process emotions and feelings and reflections. I needed to process these, these experiences I had. And so I just start, pulled out a Word document and started writing. And by the end of it, I had this really raw but very long draft. And then uh, my now girlfriend at the time just really encouraged me to turn it into something special like a book because there were some powerful moments in there. And that's kind of how it started. It just started as a cathartic way to move through some emotions. And eventually it just turned into this, this three-year process of uh, honing, editing, polishing, cutting and polishing. And But the initial process was just catharticism. And once you got back home, or maybe even before that, when, I guess a better question, when did you start to think about your next trip? Oh, man. So when I got back home, I was pretty, uh, you know, travel had taken a toll on me. The last thing I wanted to do was look up flights or figure out how to get from point A to point B. I just wanted to nest. Understandable. I had no desire to travel, but I also knew Oklahoma wasn't where I wanted to be. I, I had just kind of outgrown my hometown and my home state. And I just, I was ready for something different. So about nine or 10 months into me being home, I was struggling. I, I hadn't find, found that next step in my career. I was struggling to relate to friends and family. The pandemic was happening. We were in the middle of the global pandemic. So about 10 months in, I was like, you know what? I just need to get out of town, clear my head. So I, I bought a flight to Mexico to go lay low for a little bit. And I haven't left. I've been here ever since. Was and it a one-way ticket again? It was it was a one it was a one-way ticket, yes, but I had I had the intention of coming home within like a couple of weeks. I just didn't buy it for some reason. I don't know why. I just bought a one-way flight. But I was like, okay, I'll be back in a few weeks, maybe a month, no big deal. But I just I've been here ever since, and I, I, I'm dating the girl that um, a girl that I met down there and wrote the book with. She helped edit it and co-author it, and it's, it's just turned into this really special, unexpected moment in my life. So, then as you traveled the entire world, yeah, all the continents you've you've visited, et cetera, et cetera. How did you decide on that one? You've admitted it's a small town in Mexico. How did you decide upon that town? That's a, I love these questions. See, these are good questions. These are questions I'm, I, I Tell wasn't boss asked upon coming home. <laughs> I love it. These are great questions. Uh, so I was looking for a lot of different things. And this little town I'm in called Silita, Mexico, it just checks off a lot of the, the marks that I'm looking for. So it's right on the water. It's in a Spanish speaking country. I'm trying to, I want to learn and be immersed in, the, in Spanish so I can improve my language skills. I'm able to go out onto the water and surf anytime I want. Um, the town is walkable. You can walk from end to end in 20 minutes, so I don't need a car. That was a big, a big piece for me is I didn't want a car. I wanted to walk or rely on the public transportation. And even though it's a small town, it has a big city energy. There's a lot going on. There's always something happening. And so I, I like that combination of okay small and walkable but big energy 
And so when I came here, I just knew this was the place. This is the place I wanted to be. And I've been in Sayulita for two years now. Nice. What did you learn from either the travels or putting it all into the book form? Oh, man. I learned more than I bargained for. Uh, <laughs> there, there were many, many things I learned. I think the two that jump out to me, the most potent ones is work. We're all the same. We really are. <laughs> On every continent, human beings at their cellular level are the same. We want the same things. We're not as different as we think or the media wants it wants us to think. So and and it's one thing to say that and have a conversation about, it, but it's another to see it. Sure. It's another thing to go to the Middle East and see people fighting and yearning for the same things we are here in America or Mexico. And then the second thing was just, um, I didn't realize how sheltered I was until I left the United States of America, but I also didn't realize what a privilege it is to even leave your home country until I left. So that kind of conflicting dichotomy is like, wow, I was so sheltered growing up. There's so much more out there that I can even realize, but also realizing, wow, most people never even leave their home country. What a blessing it is for me to even be able to travel. Oh, and so just that gratefulness and that empathy really has touched my heart. And just it's just made me better able to connect with people who are may seem very different than me. So those are the two biggest things for me. And I'm not going to ask you your favorite place, but I am going to ask you, <laughs> to, I'm going to ask you to name a couple of places where you visited that you really enjoyed that maybe I've never even heard of? Mm, okay. Again, great question, John. These are questions I have not gotten yet. I really appreciate them. I'm going to throw out a couple. So one that jumps out to me is um, Southern Bosnia. So Bosnia is a small country in Eastern Europe, you know, war-torn from the 90s, the civil war in the 90s, but now it is just this it, it it's been rebuilt the economy is much better people are living normal lives and southern bosnia to me was this really special off the beaten path place that i i would love to go back to so that's one place i i absolutely adored and then the second was a uh, hobart tasmania so it's a small island off the coast of Australia. It's actually still part of Australia. Uh, but Tasmania was just oozing with character and charm. And I think it's actually known to have the cleanest air in the world. And so nice. those two to me are really special places. Okay. So what's next for you? What's next for me? So I, I've gotten really good feedback from the book. The, it's, it's my first book and uh, you know, it's not perfect, but it's a really good and powerful first read and first book. I've gotten enough feedback where I'm going to try and write the second. So that's kind of where I'm aiming next is I'm going to move forward and get that second out there because I've been told by writers and authors, if you want to sell the first book, write the second. If you want to sell the second, write the third. So I'm going to move forward and write the second. Well, you stole my, my next question about this, the next book. But what will the book be then? Will it be uh, more about that first trip, like more in depth, or will it be about your travel since? Yeah, so I, not to give too much away, but I sure. end the first book with right before I moved to Mexico. So it's coming home from the year around the world, but before I moved to Mexico. So the second book will be all about Mexico, falling in love with this country and this culture, but also falling in love with the woman that I am now. So it'll be kind of, just falling in love with my person, but falling in love with the country as well. So it'll be all things Mexico and all things love. Well, that's exciting. I look forward to that. Now, I will admit, I haven't read your book yet. I have ordered it. Uh, oh, nice. Uh, hasn't gotten to me yet, but it, I trust the mail service and I trust Amazon. It will. But uh, this is your time. Tell me tell me what makes your – I know why I wanted it, but you tell me what, why you think your book is different than all these other – because there are a million travel memoirs out there. Why does yours stand out? Great question, John. I believe mine stands out because of just the vulnerability I 
layout in the book. I've gotten overwhelming feedback from people saying, I am amazed at what you were willing to share about your personal life. And so the vulnerability, I think, can touch a lot of people very deeply, and especially men. I think men have a hard time, a lot of times, expressing or showing emotion. And I've had a lot of men reach out and just thank me for sharing my story about the grief I was going through and the conflicting emotions I had. And so my book, I think, stands out like, yes, there's a lot of special places, and a lot of special cities and countries and reflections, but the real gym or the real standing out of the book is the vulnerability I share with it. Okay. You've traveled thousands of miles. Uh, give us a travel tip. A travel tip. Okay. The, the best travel tip I can share is anything you're looking for, any help you need, anything you're struggling to find, ask a local, ask someone. Very simple. They will be willing to go above and beyond to help you. So if you're looking for the best place to eat, ask a local. If you're lost, ask a local. That is the best piece of advice I can give. And it, it can sometimes turn into a drink or a new friend or a, just a chance meeting y years down the road. So ask a local when in doubt. And those kind of organic connections are really special. Great advice. Before I let you go, tell everybody where they can find out more information about you, where they can find out more information about your book, Gravel Roads. So I, my book can be found on all of the major platforms and retailers. Amazon is, of course, the most notorious, but it's also available on Apple Books, Kobo, uh, Barnes & Noble, all the major retailers. Uh, my website is ryancrane-author.com. And then I'm hanging out on Facebook and Instagram as well. So those are the kind of places where, where you can find me. Well, I found you and I'm sure anybody else could find you. Most importantly, they could find the book. Like I said, um, I was looking through books. It really caught my eye for a lot of reasons. And I really can't wait to, to, to jump into it, especially after talking to you and hearing your story. Fascinating story. And, and I, I really, I appreciate your time. And um, when, you, when the second book comes out, I know it's a way off. But when that second book comes out, I'd love to, to do an update with you. That would be amazing. Thank you for your support and, and buying and reading the book. So I appreciate you as well. Thank you, Ryan. You have a great night. You as well, sir.